Hey, everybody. This is uh, Ray with 52 Ancestors. Amy Johnson Crow has a program where you write about uh, an ancestor every week of the year. So here's number one for me, Jeremiah Bacon. He lived from 1657 to 1709. This should be a fun project. I tried to write about an ancestor each week back in 2019, but I faltered about halfway through the year. My plan in 2023 is to look at my ancestors whose parents arrived in the colonies during the Puritan Great Migration, a 20-year time period from 1620 to 1640. Many thousands of people arrived during that period, and I would like to focus on the children of those people. Now, Nathaniel Bacon can be found in Wikitree. He's Bacon 95. He lived from about 1621 to 1672. He arrived in 1640, right at the end of the PGM time frame in Barnstable from Stratton, Rutlandshire, England. He married Hannah Mayo on 4 December 1642, and they had eight children. Were Nathaniel and Hannah excited, afraid, hopeful, persistent when they joined together in this new town? Speaking about the project with my sisters and mom this morning about this profile brought to light that we're talking about Bacon and Mayo. Well, maybe you had to be there. Since I'm focusing on the generation after the migration, people typically born in the colony, I'll focus here on their son, Jeremiah Bacon, my sixth great-grandfather. Imagine there were probably less than a thousand people in Barnstable when Jeremiah was born 8 May, 1657. He's listed in the first settlers of Barnstable, the New England Historic and Genealogical Register in 1848, volume two, with his parents and siblings. Growing up with five older siblings and two younger must have been quite an experience. Their house couldn't have been very large. Jeremiah is also listed in Amos Otis's genealogical notes of Barnstable families. Here's where we find some good detail. That was written in 1888, and this is volume one, page 21. Jeremiah's older sister, Hannah, is listed as one of the remote members of the Barnstable Church in 1683, probably living with her husband, a reverend in Taunton, Mass. Jeremiah was a tanner, just like his father, Nathaniel. His house was a two-story building with a lean-to on the west end, stood a little distance northeast from William Cobb's house. His tannery was in the low ground on the northeast of his house. It's related of Jeremiah's father that as there were other tanneries in town, it's probable they worked at their trade in the winter and were employed in the cultivation of lands the remainder of the year. I think this land was on the north side of the old King's Highway, just east of Meeting House Hill. Well, Jeremiah married December 1686 to Elizabeth Howes of Yarmouth. Ten children were born to this family. Sarah, Anna, Mercy, my fifth great-grandmother, born 30 January 1690, Samuel, Jeremiah, Joseph, Ebenezer, Nathaniel, Job, and Elizabeth. Poor Elizabeth with so many children underfoot. Well, Jeremiah died in 1706, age 49, leaving a good estate, which was settled in February 1713. The deeds are still there in the Barnstable Courthouse, or the, or the wills and probate. His house lot, a part of the Dimmick Farm, contained nine acres, and he had 30 acres in the common field adjoining the house lot on the north. Lands at Stony Cove, which I haven't found, and at Middleborough, meadows and woodland. Of the homestead, two and three-fourths acres were set off to son Job. This land is now, in 1888, owned by William Cobb. To Samuel, his eldest son, and his mother, three acres bounded by Joe Bacon with the barn and other buildings thereon. To Jeremiah, the one I'm speaking about, second son, three and a half acres bounded, now the town road to the common field. Other children are mentioned in Jeremiah's will. Son Nathaniel had one third of land at Middleborough, etc. In his portion were one silver spoon, one silver porringer, etc. And Nathaniel's widow, Elizabeth, and daughters, Anna and Mercy, had portions set to them in severalty. Sarah and Elizabeth are not named and were probably dead. Well, I hope that gives just a glimmer of an ancestor and his family from long ago. If you want to read about the smelly and lowly task of making leather, take a look at this website, blackstockleather.com. I just want to read you a little bit of it. The history of the leather tanning industry dates further back than you can imagine, and it's unlikely we'd be where we are today without leather. Leather has been an essential tool in almost every aspect of life. It can be made into a light and fabric-like vellum or a hard book cover. It can form soft, delicate gloves, as well as impenetrable armor. 
Leather belts and straps have been incorporated into everything from human attire to luggage cases to saddlery to machinery. This incredibly versatile resource has helped men and women to travel great distances on foot and then harness horses. In the past, it has also allowed us to bottle water, protect our bodies and homes from the elements, communicate, and even conduct business. The work of the ancient tanner was unglamorous, to say the least. It started with an arduous preparatory stage that could take several weeks. First, the animal skins were cleaned and softened with water. Once cleaned, the tanner still had to pound the hides to remove excess fat and flesh. Next, to loosen the hair follicles, they would either coat the hides with an alkaline lime mixture, leave the hides out to putrefy for months, or soak them in vats of urine before removal with a dull knife called scudding. In the baiting stage, tanners worked animal dung or brains into the skins, either by beating with sticks or kneading them in a vat of feces and water. The combination of bacteria enzymes found in animal waste and the beating or kneading action fermented the skin and made it supple. Understandably, ancient tanneries were always found on the outskirts of towns. With the malodorous preparatory work complete, the hides were ready for tanning. From ancient times and through the 18th century, tanners used a chemical compound called tannin, derived from tree bark and certain plant leaves. Hides were stretched out on frames and immersed in vats concentrated amounts of tannin. Tannins bind to the collagen proteins in the hide and coat them, causing them to become less water-soluble, more bacteria-resistant, and more flexible. The Industrial Revolution Lucian brought new adventure advancements in technology, which help increase efficiency and diversify the leather making process. Patent leather, known for its glossy varnish surface, was invented in 1819. Chromium tanning, which involves one of the most efficient tanning agents, was developed during the 1850s and could replace vegetable tanning. Synthetic leather, leather was developed after World War II and became a cost-effective ethical alternative to genuine leather. Well, there you have it, Jeremiah Bacon, Tanner, just like his father in the 1650s, and um, ancestor number one for me. Thanks. <laughs> Stop. <laughs>